ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's Corsite Conversations. Uh, today is the future of retail with the Gordon Brothers. We have Rick Edwards, Mark Dufton, and Jeff Bloom joining us. And with that, I'd like to take it over to our CEO and founder, Deborah Winesway. Good afternoon, and welcome to Corsite Conversations, the future of retail with Gordon Brothers. I'm your host, Deborah Weinswig, and I'm honored to be joined by Rick Edwards, Mark Dufton, and my good friend, Jeff Bloomberg. Rick Edwards is responsible for the growth strategy at Gordon Brothers while overseeing all retail client engagements and daily operations. He lends specific merchandising expertise, strategic planning, and leadership to asset disposition deals. He's also responsible for the overall strategic vision and retail business development initiatives. Mark Dufton brings more than 25 years of real estate and management experience to Gordon Brothers. In his current role, he leverages his broad industry expertise to further expand both Gordon Brothers' core real estate businesses and its growing and expanding services. And lastly, Jeff Bloomberg, who made all this happen today, he works with many senior level re, um, retailers and companies. And these, this is really across the Gordon Brothers platform. He's also worked closely with all of Gordon mm -hmm. Brothers' business groups since joining the firm in 01. Jeff is an accomplished financial mm -hmm. executive and recognized expert in retail mergers and acquisitions. So with that, today we're gonna to discuss uh, many things in a short period of time. That includes the current retail real estate environment, how retailers are adapting, how they're planning for the future as it relates to inventory, and also thinking about reopening their stores. As always, we'll have a video available on our site in 24 hours. Uh, we will have some poll questions, and if anyone has a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen during our conversation if you'd like to ask questions. So with that, I'll kick off the first question to Rick. I would say that we've spent more time in the past week, which is a positive, talking about the restart, the reopening. How are you helping retailers think through that, and how are they making decisions on on when and how, uh, mm -hmm. despite you know changes and differences throughout the United States? Um, great question, Deborah. Thank you. So you know we've been working with a lot of our clients, um, both on the healthy and the distressed side, about what the world's going to look like when they reopen. You know, clearly it's a um, unique environment. COVID is um, something that no one's ever really anticipated before. Stores were forced to close on a very quick but rolling basis. And how the restart is going to um, occur is really, you know, something that we're continuing to evolve our thoughts on. But, you know, first and foremost, we do know that as retail begins to open and we're seeing some of our clients begin to open stores um, on a rolling basis, depending on the state mandates and the jurisdictions. But the number one issue is trying to get a core group of stores open. Certainly not every store and a chain is gonna open at once, but in all instances, they're preparing and we're working with them, our operations teams and our merchants <clears throat> to discuss what it looks like when they do open a store. <clears throat> a lot of what we're seeing from our clients is essentially they're, they're understanding that the social distancing protocols are gonna to need to stay in effect, that there will be a different level of normal within the store environment. So that means within a relatively short period of time, even for large retailers, they need to adapt to have things like the registered mm -hmm. checkout um, uh, systems in place in order to have like the plexiglass shields, whether or not the employees are gonna wear masks, the six foot separation, the tapes on the floor. So virtually all of our clients are looking about what it looks like when they open the store and they're prepared to open. And I think they've done pretty much a good job during this interim of mm -hmm. spending a lot of their focus on what it's gonna look like when they do open up and we're working with them. You know, and it is sector specific, but clearly we're seeing that there is a push to get them up and going and that they know there's a new normal out there. Well, the challenge has been, right, a lot of this inventory has been getting stale in their boxes. So the sooner that they can, you know, kind of get their doors open and bring people in, that inventory will have a longer lifespan, right? Yeah, and, and it depends on the, the sector as well. Certainly in the apparel sector, there's been a lot of talk around and a lot of um, articles written about spring inventory and massive discounting that'll happen when and if the stores open up. What we're actually seeing, what I'm talking to a lot of our clients about is, somewhat the opposite effect. The supply chain has been significantly disrupted and that many retailers have canceled um, either late spring or the summer good season entirely so that when they do begin to reopen that their stores are gonna be essentially in the, as I said, retail uh, fashion uh, apparel sector, 
they'll be loaded with spring goods. But in a lot of these instances, what they're going to do is they're going to try to grind it out through the summer because they can't get the summer goods back into the pipeline, back into the stores. And they're really punting it in a lot of instances to be back in place for the fall. Now, certainly they're trying to look at what the sales levels and anticipate what they'll be in the fall and adjust their open device accordingly. Um, but you know what we're hearing from a significant mem- number of our clients is that they're just going to try to survive on what they have. Mark, as we think about that, how has the relationship between the landlord and the tenant changed during this time? And how much are the landlords trying to help the tenants get open? Yeah, good afternoon, Deborah. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so there's been a, um, I think around mid-March, it was a mad, a- after uh, the retailers realized they were closing stores. It was a mad rush to uh, scour through all of their leases to see what would what would allow them to uh, to not pay rent and did they have any legal standing? Uh, and that wore off pretty quickly, I think, and everybody just realized there, there's three parties in this boat: the lenders, the landlord, and the retailers. And uh, since then, obviously, most of the uh, stores that did that closed did not pay their April rent. Some retailers dealt with it just on a one month basis. They sent a letter to the landlord saying, hey, we're not paying April, let's see what happens going forward. Uh, there was a lot of uh, form letters out there you know, maintaining your legal, your legal rights under your lease. But I think that's just a little bit of posturing. The reality is that there's a pretty heightened sense of cooperation because everybody has a vested interest in getting back up and running. But I think it's it's really uh, coming down to, as we expected, a three-month issue. It's going to be April, May, and June, as it looks like right now, at least from a, uh, a full rent and occupancy perspective. The, the most prevalent deal uh, we see out there, and, and a number of the, the larger landlords and public companies, public REITs, have taken pretty firm positions uh, publicly. But behind the scenes, they, they really are cooperating, at least with most of their tenants. Mm-hmm. And I would say the, the deal we see the most is deferring April, May, and June rent. And that gets paid uh, starting in 2021 over, over a 12-month period. And there's, there's many variations of that. Some folks will want to go to percentage rent while they ramp their business back up. Uh, other folks are trying to get complete abatement. But you know the landlords are very sophisticated at this at this restructuring game. It is it, this is certainly a little bit of a different game, different set of circumstances. But they're very um, very savvy as it as it relates to analyzing the tenants' financials. So right now, what's going on is a big download of retailer financials to the landlords, so they can really see how that particular retailer is being affected, and how we can how they can reach an agreement so that we can move forward. I, I don't think anybody in this industry wants two to five years of uh, legal wrangling over this. Well, uh, you know, the, the, the business was on its knees to begin with. So there is, a, there is a good sense of cooperation. The corporate real estate folks working for retailers, uh, this is their full-time job right now. They're not, uh, uh, they're not doing any new stores. They're, you know, th- this is their focus to get past this period. Uh, right here, I call it you know, COVID period. And then, you know, take a take a long, hard, strategic look at your portfolio going forward. And there's a there's myriad uh, factors involved in that. And I think they'll take a more sophisticated uh, analytical approach to uh, to their real estate portfolios. So, Mark, you you talked about right. It's called April, May, and June rent, which is deferred, most likely not abated. Right, that's that's a lot of pressure on the the landlords. I've sure. I've not heard that much discussed in the press around you know the future of the landlords, the future of the malls. I mean, yeah. depending on whose numbers you look at, we have like eleven 1, hundred malls. I mean, is there a risk that some of these malls don't make it? Yeah, I think the uh, you know the the certainly the malls that were trouble to begin with, the B and C malls. We have about eleven 1, hundred malls in in the country. We thought uh, initially that that number would go down to seven hundred over time. Uh, that number could, could probably be lower. This could, this could hasten that. Because I, I, would, I would say in those malls, the, you know, 100% of those, the BNC malls, 100% of those retailers didn't pay. Um, so yeah, I think you could see an acceleration of uh, the, the conversion or the elimination, if you will, of, of some of those malls. I mean, they were on a path, they were on a path, Deborah, before that. Uh, 
but this this will this will certainly expedite. This will hasten it. Yeah. And Jeff, if you think about right those stores that were maybe already destined to close, do you think that we see an acceleration in that? Do you think they reopen? What do they do with their inventory? Do they bring their inventory back to the the DCs, the warehouses? What do you think happens? No, I think in in, in general they're going to reopen initially because the best way to monetize the inventory that they have in the stores and in the the whole chain is through store either closing sales or or, or in the stores themselves. It it costs them more to redistribute the goods among the chain and and lastly. Um, the slow moving inventory that they have is just going to be compounded by trying to do so. So they're much better off clearing the merchandise through the stores. Now, what happens in a little while or in a month or two months is another issue. The stores that are targeted for closing, I, I think, clearly will close, as well as an evaluation, certainly over the next uh, four to six months, um, on which bubble stores really don't make sense anymore. Um, I don't anticipate that the the volume and the retail sales in stores, given what's happened in China and elsewhere where it's opened up, will get back to normal for a while, probably not, not until the fourth quarter of this year or the first quarter of next year. And Rick, as you think about inventory, whether it's, you know, summer versus holiday or however you want to think about it, the, the next season uh, versus before holiday starts, what do those goods look like? Is that leftover spring? Have retailers accelerated summer, broad and fall? What's what's happening from that perspective? And, and how does that also impact the consumer's experience? So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, clearly the goods that are, as it relates to apparel, you know, hard goods are a little bit different. They have a longer shelf life. It's, it's core basic merchandise where the intrinsic value doesn't diminish over time unless it's truly seasonal based. But as it specifically relates to apparel, you know, clearly they were in some ways fortunate that they had gotten through, most of the retailers had gotten through their, their winter clearance program um, to a large degree, and they were left with what I'll call their core spring. Their core spring, while it may not be, you know, the right color, the right weight, it's still somewhat appropriate for the summer season and you know up until they can get what I'll call the back to school and, and that's what a lot of them are, are banking on is can I get back into business for back to school which typically kicks off in you know early August you know can they get the inventory through the supply chain can they get it into the stores is it the right mix um, they're really just going to as I said try to get through unless they, they can opportunistically buy some spot goods in the market which it'll be there but not the ability to execute will be key. They really need to just kind of get through what I'll call June, July, and into August before they're back in inventory position. And clearly, it's going to hurt margins. It's going to hurt the customer experience. Um, but you know, e-com will be a little bit of a different measure. They will have some fresh goods for um, you know summer because they they are continuing to run their e-com. But you know, those who do not run a robust e-com business, uh, they're going to struggle in order to have the right. Uh, mix and seasonality, but they'll have to clear what they have. Have you seen retailers invest uh, at this point, or do you expect them to for the rest of the year? Those who had kind of a less than robust e-commerce business, are you seeing them, you know, spend there or collaborate or partner? What are you seeing? I haven't, I haven't seen them collaborate um, together, but what I have had discussions where, you know, where you would never see this before, where if it's what I'd call a less than robust e-com platform, where they are actually trying to um, reverse goods back into the e-com facility so that they're available for sale. But um, you know, by and large, I think your, your retailers that do e-com well are gonna continue to do it well. We're seeing, and everybody we're talking to, that the sales have increased exponentially. I think some of that will slide back once stores start to get open, but clearly it's gonna di differentiate um, those who can execute an econ strategy well and those who cannot and the ones that cannot are going to suffer more so than the ones that can execute a good strategy. So Mark, Rick talked a little bit about this kind of these retailers who are less than robust and, and how they're working to, you know, kind of have a more successful uh, rest of the year than they have beginning of the year. These kind of okay stores, uh, whether it's a whole chain or whether a retailer had some in their portfolio that were less robust, you know, these that were on the cusp, 
What do you think happens to these stores for the rest of this year? And if you have a crystal ball into next year as well? Well, I think that, um, as I mentioned, it'd be two phases here, the COVID phase, just dealing with the, the rent uh, for the next three months and then move, you know, looking at your strategically at your portfolio moving forward, every, every retailer analyzing that it's their second largest expense line that they have. And I think to, you know, to date, maybe a little bit before COVID, but not as much as there should have been. There was, there was not a critical assessment uh, of real estate and, and how to handle it and how to manage your expenses and what size should your store be. So uh, that, that will get, um, you know, a much closer, uh, much closer inspection going forward. I think you could see, uh, you know, Rick and I were talking about some of the numbers prior to this. I think you could easily see 20 to 25,000 stores uh, coming out of this closing. I think I mentioned to you that, you know, we think there could be 100,000 plus restaurants which will close just because, you know, they require more capital open back up because they need fresh inventory. But you're going to see a lot of, you'll see a lot of natural lease expirations uh, coming out of this. And you'll see a lot of folks evaluating what their footprint is going to be and really try and try and more desperately to eliminate eliminate those bubble stores and and get a good core group of of profitable full wall profitable stores so you talk about this idea of 20 to 25,000 closures which is a big number yeah. what do you right there's been this move to kind of the these dark stores and if we're seeing a you know kind of an increase in penetration of e-commerce what do you think happens with these boxes well, it's been happening, and again, it continue to happen. Is um, you know, the stuff that's not core real estate, or that has maintained its occupancy and maintained its rent levels. The stuff just off the uh, off the fifty yard line, you know, will continue to explore either quasi retail options, uh, you know, education services, churches, gyms, uh, entertainment, et cetera. Uh, we've just seen an abundance of that coming into the marketplace. We've had to basically address all of our, you know, all of our databases for replacement tenants were focused around retail tenants. Hmm. And, you know, that, that just doesn't, that just doesn't exist to the extent that it once did. And I've heard, heard folks talking about, you know, online retailers, um, you know, trying to take up some of the space. It's such a small blip on the radar, Deborah, that, you know, it can't even, you know, begin to fill the, the um, hundreds of thousands and millions of square feet of vacancy that's out there. So it, again, you're looking at quasi retail stuff, you're looking at uh, residential, you know, maybe as we discussed prior to this, some conversion to, to warehouse, uh, <clears throat> since that's been, been such a strong sector and has been continued demand for that. Uh, but you're, you're just, you're just going to see uh, an erosion down to uh, the point where as Jeff mentioned the other day, you know, we have a certain number of square foot per retail per person. And uh, once, once we reach that equilibrium, then, uh, then I think things will settle a little bit more. But we, got, we have, still have a ways to go on that. So Jeff, Jeff, if you talk to different executives, you know, we keep hearing, okay, we've to cut expenses and to get us back on track, right? We've eliminated marketing, we're not paying rent. What other, you know, if you will, draconian measures are you seeing them take that they can make it through this year, that they're not part of that 20 to 25,000 who are closing um, stores and potentially, you know, not reopening? Oh, I think right now there's such a focus on liquidity and uh, they're all waist deep in alligators. So they're, they're just plugging along trying to stay alive, make sure that they're afloat and then sort of focusing on being ready to spring back into action um, with personnel issues, with other aspects, of personnel, inventory, et cetera, the logistics. Um, and, and then once there's sort of a level of normalcy where they can see what the world really looks like, and focusing on, on what they are going to do going forward. I think it's, it's still in, uh, in survival and liquidity mode right now, maximizing liquidity to make sure that they do get through. The other thing that you're seeing, quite frankly, is the acceleration of bankruptcies. Um, there was no need for J.C. Penney to file for bankruptcy. They had plenty of liquidity going forward. But the smart thing for them to do is, while they do have maximum liquidity, is to file, as opposed to eating up the liquidity 
that they have prior to bankruptcy. So they're in theory in a much better situation now. Whether you can take a chain that and and knock out a quarter of their stores or more and reduce your overhead to survive on that, that's the real trick going forward. Rick, based on what Jeff just said, do you think that the hardest hit sector ends up being the department stores? And, and what do you think that that landscape looks like going forward? I mean, clearly, I think that's one of them. <clears throat> you know, it's going to be significantly hard hit because it was in decline to begin with, right? And, you know, certainly with the level of inventories and their core customer, which is predominantly an older customer who may not be, um, you know, drawn back into the stores as quickly, they're going to suffer from a sales perspective. But, you know, the inventory is going to be a little bit, um, obviously, as we talked about, out of season, and it's going to be a little bit longer road, I think, for them to try to get their core customer back. And, you know, certainly, as I said, a lot of them were, were in decline, the stores are too big. And in some cases, it's been, you know, a social exper experience for some of these department stores to draw the customer in, they're going to lack that going forward, especially with people maybe a little bit hesitant to go back in the mall. But, you know, certainly I think that um, that's probably the number one sector where we're going to see distress. Yeah, and I, I got to say to, to Jeff's point earlier about these D2C brands going offline, I mean, after what they've just seen, I, I don't know, you know, if, if they want to move offline. I mean, Jeff, have you spoken to these guys and do you think that their interest is less than it was? In what sense? In Ever? online moving offline, like D2C brands moving offline. Um, I don't think they're going to go in groves online and open on <laughs> stores. It's, they're certainly not going to pick up much of the, the vacancies. Um, they may in certain markets in terms of, uh, of having some stores, but they, they lose their advantage, basically. Yeah, I mean, Mark, I'd seen many landlords, and I, I want to applaud their innovation, right, trying to bring some of these D2C brands together and to help almost like retail as a service. I think that went okay in some cases, but, yes, yeah. you know, it, and it goes back to Rick's point, right? I mean, retailers, I think D2C collaborate better, but retail by its very nature because of low barriers to entry, it's difficult. What do you see as some of these experiments, um, you know, kind of with these, you know, D2C brands? together these mashups or what do you see as the future and how can they work with some of the the landlords to you know really have a lot of brand reputation and, and strength um, without a lot of cash outlay yeah i think uh deborah as i mentioned that you know these landlords have a vested interest in keeping keeping their occupancy up and their net operating income obviously especially if you're a public company which is you know part i guess Primarily, the reason why you know Simon has decided to invest in a, a couple different retailers at this point. Obviously, they have more extensive retailer, I mean, uh, resources than most. So, their foray into it is um, a, a little less risky than it would be for a uh, smaller man uh, landlord. So, I'm not sure you're going to see that happening in mass. But I, I could see situations where there, you know, could be an effusion of of some capital. Um, by, by other landlords or other means to try to keep these uh, retailers afloat and maintain their occupancy. They're certainly going to do everything they can from a, from a rent perspective. And uh, as, as you know, they're, they're very savvy, having gone through a number of cycles of this, of rent restructuring, they're, they're pretty savvy about uh, reading retailers' financials and, and taking a deep dive and, and making sure that the retailer is you know, not just not just uh, leaning on the landlord's back for uh, for relief, but they really have a a true program to to succeed in the long term. So that that level of of cooperation will uh, again increase and continue. Um, but I'm I'm not sure you you'll see wholesale uh, approach of of landlords buying retailers. Yeah, unfortunately, I have two questions, and then we'll turn over to the poll and just to the group. So I, I had always thought, you know, kind of taking some, you know, learnings from, from the East and bringing them West, right? This idea of, you know, more, you know, kind of um, having retailers, you know, kind of invest in these show properties, right? Um, and not necessarily all of them um, being in major cities, some of them in tier two and tier three cities. We, we've seen some retailers do an excellent job of that. 
do you think that we see retailers rethink their entire portfolio um, in terms of you know how they think about flagships and you know and where they put them and and how they use them and do they go to a flagship strategy and you know the other stores they decide they don't need they can do most of it online yeah well we saw the uh we saw the flagship strategy and th now we've seen a lot of flagships close too uh, rick i can see rick laughing and uh, right i mean that that's been that's been pretty commonplace so i'm not sure that's that's the the effect the the most effective strategy i think it really does take deborah a a concerted effort at the highest level of these retail organizations, including CEOs and CFOs, to get more actively involved in real estate and, and, picking, and picking the right locations and not making mistakes with their capital. That's, that's the key to all of this. And as I, as I said, prior to this, it was starting to happen. Uh, it would take a, a retailer where it would just take you know, six months to open a store. Uh, before all this, it was probably a, a one year time frame, just because it received more scrutiny. <clears throat> And I, I don't think the real estate industry is particularly technologically savvy as, as it relates to uh, site selection and, and occupancy uh, management and maintenance. And I think, I think you'll see uh, more resources devoted towards that and, and just try, and, try not to make a mistake. Also interesting, I, I, I do think that we've seen this underinvestment in real estate research Right. Maybe this is, you know, kind of this fuels a whole new industry and, and GIS, et cetera. It's a great point. I'm sorry, Jeff. No, and I'm just saying, I think you're going through a period of reassessment. Um, what do you want to open up? What type of stores? So reevaluate your business first. Establish how you want to grow and what's important to you. And then you can look at, at what stores you want to open and where. What type of stores, what's the size? How will they look? Will they be different from what you've done in the past? So I, I think there's going to be sort of a, a, a wait and see in our valuation period before there's much um, reopening. I mean, when I say well, opening, reopening, re more openings. Yeah, Jeff, it's, it's, got, it's, it's got to be uh, quality over quantity because sure. was, for, for years it was such a focus on quantity, right? If you're a public company, you're increasing your sales by opening new stores, but your your comp store sales are getting hammered behind behind the scenes. So that's we we have to readjust to uh, have that focus on on the quality of the real estate. Yeah. So last question before we turn over the poll, and and Rick, do you think that we see? You know, we've heard that you know the belief that open air centers will be kind of the the new hot spot. How do you think that impacts the outlets versus the strips versus the closed malls? Right, there's there's a lot of questions and, and and how do you see that, you know, as retailers think about what to close, do you think they think about it by you know kind of classification of property? I think actually they'll probably take a look at it because they'll give it a, a pretty decent runway. As Jeff kind of mentioned, is what are the true bubble stores? <clears throat> I think at least initially, from what I'm, you know, unofficially hearing is that you know, most people do feel comfortable walking into an outdoor environment versus a closed mall, although I expect that to change relatively quickly, um, you know, heading into, into the fall and into Q4. So I don't think they'll look at it um, per se on a format type. They're going to look at it on a productivity type and a geography um, scale because that's where they really need to find the efficiencies. But I think that at least initially, there's going to be in some reticence for people to return to a mall. Um, and again, it's going to be the 80-20 rule, right? I think a vast majority of people will feel comfortable in some regard with some measures going into all locations, but there are going to be those that stay away. And I think that the, the people who are reticent to go into a retail environment will probably tend to stay away from the mall if they can. But I don't think that's going to drive the real estate decisions going forward. I think it's really going to be based upon really where the business is and what the strategy of the company is going forward. Hey Rick, well we're gonna we're gonna know soon enough, right? Simon yeah. Simon opened their first mall this past weekend, so we will in, in South Carolina, <laughs> and um, with all the appropriate social distancing protocols. So we'll see uh, all our surveys and estimations. We'll uh, we'll, we'll get some real life data. Spe That's speaking right. of, thank you, Mark. That was a perfect lead into the the poll. <laughs> so, um, how comfortable will you be returning to retail stores and social gatherings such as conferences, concerts, and sporting events beginning in July? And, you know, almost 40% said they would be comfortable with mandatory PPE and social distancing regulation. And so 
I think that's maybe even higher than, I mean, you know, and what people say isn't always what they do. And I think, right, all of us are so stir crazy right now. So I, I, I think that 40% is a higher number than I would have thought. I don't know. What about you guys? Yeah, I, I, I thought it would be maybe even a little bit higher than that. I think there's a difference between going to a sporting event and going to a retail store. True. Um, clearly, I think that you will see some reticence to go into large gatherings where you're standing next to people that you don't know, you know, jammed in tightly. I think more people will react um, better to going into a store where you can keep some level of social distancing. It's, I find it interesting to um, see how many people think six feet is actually like 20, right? So, <laughs> uh, you know, six feet is actually not that big a, a space, but clearly um, I think that people, you know, and, and it could come also to the benefit of the retailers where if you're not doing the large spend on a sporting event or, you know, going out to a higher end restaurant that they may be willing to spend, you know, in a retail environment, especially, and I think we talked earlier, as it's geared towards the home, you know, in all instances, whenever we see, you know, any level of economic distress, there is a flight to home, whether people are going to do small gatherings at their home, they want to spruce up their homes because they're sick of looking at the four walls and saying, I need to redecorate. Usually we see an increase in those categories, but 40%, um, I think would probably be higher if we eliminated out, you know, going to a football game. Um, yeah. But I think, I think you also, if you, if you look at it by age, I think you'll, you'll see a major difference. Younger people will skew much higher in terms of it, older people much less. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. All right, the second question, with retail stores closed, consumers have been shopping more online, how have your retail habits changed? 45% uh, said they've been purchasing items online for delivery, but will return to retail stores once they reopen. You know, that's actually consistent. We talked with one of the largest grocers who said they had gone from kind of 2% online to 12%. They expected to give about half of that back when, you know, everything went back to business as usual. What, what do you guys think about that answer? Well, that's still a, that, that's still a big number though, right? Even if you give it's, half of yeah. it back, right? Deborah, I mean, you're, you're talking about a very low margin business in the grocery store. Uh, in grocery stores, and I did just see that uh, Instacart is hiring, you know, several hundred thousand people. So, uh, you know, they may, uh, I assume they have better better data or assumptions than we do. But I think I think it could uh, could fundamentally change the the grocery business and the grocery, you know, more importantly, the, as Jeff mentioned, the grocery anchored uh, retail real estate, oh, yeah. which has been sort of been sort of the core property for for retail real estate for for many years and i think that if that uh, that could that could be i'm generally pretty uh pretty bullish on on retail real estate once it's once it reaches its equilibrium but that could be a game changer and be really catastrophic to start uh start wiping out a bunch more grocery stores because delivery has become the norm or more commonplace or, or just a big much bigger piece of the pie I, I think you, you, the number of visits may change. People will go into stores, but I think the frequency with which they, they do go into stores and shop in, in brick and mortar may but change. But Jeff, you bring up a good point, right? Because the average customer goes 2.1 times a week to a grocer. If they go, maybe it's once every two weeks, those are some pretty big changes in terms of dollars spent in a store. So I don't think you, you never visit a grocery store again. I think far from it. But I do think maybe the dollars you spend there will will change pretty significantly. So I, I I agree with all you guys. All right, last one. Do you see the for do you foresee mall formats changing? Yes, they will shift to lifestyle centers versus shopping destinations. Uh, it's about fifty five percent. I also heard this idea that I mean I've heard some pretty I'm sure you know really draconian numbers in terms of of the eleven hundred malls you know kind of those that will stay open. But I have heard this idea that a lot of them will turn into town centers and you know kind of be much more more social so i don't know what do you guys think when do you feel comfortable congregating um i think that's the whole question if you feel comfortable congregating with people either whom you don't know or know very casually then you can have much more of a community orientation if you don't feel comfortable congregating with them it's not going to be very effective I mean, I just as an example, I think the, May, the market by Macy's was a brilliant concept uh, at the time it was initiated. It's not such a good because it really takes away. It, it stimulates business without being price promotional. So they're trying to do wine tastings. They're doing a number of other community-oriented 
events, which I think is 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 the way they should be going. The problem is in the, in the virus uh, in, in this environment. Is that effective? Do I want to go with a bunch of people I don't know and have a wine taste? Yeah, no, well, point. Deborah, I, I, I would just say from a real estate perspective that uh, we've seen some great, great conversions to uh, to lifestyle centers, which have been very successful. You know, unfortunately, it's just not the solution across the board. There's there's a lot of centers that you still have to have demand for for the services and for the retail and for the entertainment to be able to do this conversion. In a lot of these cases, the the markets have moved away from some of these older malls and you know, some of these B and C malls, um, and there's you know it's just not there's just not the demand there. So that that stuff will uh, again uh, be keep, be completely shut down or you know turn into housing or you know something else. So it's it sounds great to to talk about these lifestyle centers, but it's it's going to apply to a relatively small percentage of the uh, of the malls. And, and look, once you have a, a vaccine and people feel comfortable, and you, if you can get life back to what was the the old norm, then I think it's fine. But it's until that happens, I don't see it it, it working very well right now. Great. So we have many questions that came in. Um, and for those of you who haven't had the chance to ask, please use the Q and A at the bottom of your screen. So we will kind of try and rapid fire these and, and get through as many as we can. And uh, I'll let you answer them in your own time if we um, can't during the call. So what kinds of concessions besides rent deferrals are you seeing from landlords? Yeah, deferral is uh, deferral is obviously the, the biggest issue. I would say it's going, the concessions are more going the other way. The, uh, you know, the landlords are asking the tenants to uh, give up certain things, some of their co-tenancy provisions and and um, you know non-monetary clauses like that. I, I don't think the um, I don't I don't think the landlords are going to give much beyond uh, beyond deferral uh, of the rent at this point. They're they're, they're going to do it in conjunction with with asking, and we we've seen that already, especially with uh, the the large uh, the larger landlords. They've asked for some concession. There'll, there'll be some retailers who are in a position to have uh leverage to um, to ask for some concessions maybe early termination rights or kickout rights which is probably probably the most prominent perfect all right and what do you think the apparel inventory liquidation value is in today's market <laughs> let me get my crystal ball I, that's what I was like i'd love to hear that answer so <laughs> you know certainly that's the number one question we're getting asked um because obviously there is a, you know, we deal with a lot of lenders who set their NOLV advance rates based upon um, the inventory. It really depends on the individual sector and the quality and the mix um, of the inventory, but certainly it's down, you know, again, it's, it's tough to pinpoint a number, um, but it's down significantly. And the real question is, is whether or not you can you know, realign your strategy as it relates to a liquidation to maximize the NOLV, which is a net orderly liquidation value, meaning can you run a sharper model that minimizes the expenses because the level of the, the recovery value on the inventory is not as um, high as it would have been, you know, six weeks ago. But, you know, certainly it's lower. Definitely. Um, how can vendors handle excess inventories if they close the majority of their stores? In terms of the vendors, or I mean, the, the vendors obviously would ship. I think vendors are going to be stuck with inventory um, until they can sell it. You know, we've seen on our commercial industri industrial side of our business a significant amount of incoming opportunities to purchase, you know, entire wholesale inventories, which were scheduled to go into um, retailers here in the month of March and April and May. What we're seeing right now is that there's not a lot of activity from even the secondary retail market to purchase that inventory. What you're finding is in the wholesale market, um, in a lot of cases, there is a opportunity to buy it, but you have to hold on to it for up to nine months. So the value for the vendor is really is um, either buy it and hold it for next spring, which they don't want to do, um, or sell it at you know prices that they're certainly not really interested or want to sell it because it's suppressed. It's, it's a very difficult situation for the vendors. 
Yeah, no, it's a, it's a tough place to be. This is a great question um, and one I've gotten quite a bit. In the current uh, environment, what brick and mortar retail format um, sustainability, well, basically, what kind of measures do you see on the safety side for apparel and how can retailers make sure their customers feel safe? So, you know, as we talked about earlier, I think that the social distancing protocols are going to certainly need to be in place and that meaning the six, the six foot distance, making sure number one, that the employees first and foremost are protected with the PPE. Um, as it relates to apparel, and that's a question that, that you know we've had quite often is that there seems to be some sort of a stigma between buying apparel and buying any other type of merchandise. And this virus transmits across a wide base of surfaces and apparel in a lot of ways is no different than going into a Home Depot if a customer is touching a box the, the virus transmits, you know, as it transmits, but there is a seemingly, there's a stigma as it relates to apparel. Um, I, I personally don't think that that will be a, a significant um, factor as it relates to whether or not someone's going to purchase an item, because as we get deeper into this and as we get closer to what we're anticipating to be somewhat of a June start, I think, of, you know, there'll be enough um, written about how the disease is transmitted and how you know, people are affected by it. But I think that, um, you know, when you really take a step back on it, any person entering a store is likely to transmit the, the, the virus across any type of surface. So once we get past that stigma on apparel, I think it'll pass. Okay. Um, th this is a great one as well. Um, you know, can you share any insights into how you think about mom and pop restaurants uh, there was a strong movement which added to value to lifestyle centers. Do you see this continuing or do you think restaurants will be severely hit and slowly come back? I mean, you talked about the 100,000 number. Uh, this question was asked after that, but do you see, and, and maybe we can just extend this question to mom and pop restaurants and mom and pop yeah. retail. Yeah, I would say, uh, so of the of the restaurant closings, I think the hardest hit will be the uh, a lot of the casual dining and, and a, lot of the, a lot of mom and pop restaurants. They've been They've been relying on PPP and you know takeout delivery, and you know, that that is that is not going to carry them very far. So as their as their cash flow dwindles, as I mentioned, trying to trying to get back up and running um, is is going to be very difficult for these folks. And in fact, you've even seen uh, while well, the QSR, McDonald's and the like have, have stayed open. You know their st their numbers are still down slightly too. They'll recover and and be just fine. But I think it's going to be casual dining and, and mom and pop restaurants that uh, that will struggle. And, and I'm hoping there'll be some. <clears throat> it looks it appears right now that the restaurants will be sort of the last vestige of the of the retail to to open up uh, as we're slowly opening up. So they're they're going to be affected the most. I'm hoping there's some additional. Uh, funds for them just because I mentioned because of the capital you need to get restarted because uh, I think they are an integral part of of you know rebuilding the economy and taking some of this real estate and I view them as as critically important and you know I, I think there's there's folks who would want to uh, reopen and folks who want to start new businesses and you know we have to we have to be able to give them that opportunity or else it's you know it's going to be a very troubling trend to uh, to have that number of of restaurants not not open, I I think it's it'll be interesting to see what happens in Georgia with the the reopening of restaurants. Right. But think of a bar, think right. think of um, a restaurant that depends on their bar business, and most businesses most, most restaurants aren't doing thirty percent EBITDA margins. So if you take out half the seats, which is the I think probably the minimum that's going to be done right now, so you're going to have half the covers. Are you going to have twice the turns to give you the same business that you had before? I don't think so. I don't think you're going to put people on the clock and say, okay, you had an hour and a half to eat dinner to two hours to be allocated. Now you're going to have to finish your dinner or lunch in half the time so we can turn over the table. If you yes. take a bar scene, are you going to have every third bar seat, every other, every fourth? How many, how many, you're going to have 50 yeah. people hanging around the bar? Not yeah, for, depends. Not good for the point, Jeff. Depending on the size and configuration of the restaurant, I spoke with a couple of restaurant owners in, in the in the past week. Uh, one of whom said, um, "You know, just because of the the size of my restaurant and the way the seating and the bar is configured, that if they open up with you know full social distancing rules, as as you mentioned, that 
it's it's really it's really not going to be feasible from an economic perspective for him to uh, to fully open. But even and to just point right, even if you are are very um, structured in terms of where people sit and how they sit, I mean, think about right, like a movie theater. Right. So you put people six feet apart, but then I want to go get popcorn, so I walk in front of you. Right. I, I just think that you know we can all drive ourselves pretty crazy, but it's you know I think it's challenging. But you know, getting getting reopened is is a good thing for the economy and certainly a good thing for the these mom and pops. It's yeah. also probably going to be very difficult to do a lot of bar business while you're wearing a mask. It's tough to drink <laughs> and have a mask on at the same time. Oh. I haven't figured that out yet. Put straws or put straws in the mask. That's right. <laughs> um, Rick, I think this question is for you, and it's probably, you know, I, anything with a number people want to hear. Best guess, what percent of sales comp can we expect this year for Q3 and Q4 versus a year ago, especially apparel, accessories, and footwear? So it's called discretionary. Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> well, the people, that I, the people that I've spoken with <clears throat> um, obviously are, are planning and they're closely following the, you know, the China model. Um, you know, certainly the, the, the retailers, again, are looking at probably down, again, there's the first six weeks, which are expecting about 50% down with a gradual return as they head into Q3, Q4, down 20 to 25%. I think that you know there's an opportunity to do better than that. We have seen um, through some of the openings in Europe and other locales where the business is stronger than they would have expected. Um, as I said, we spoke to somebody uh, two days ago who opened up a group of stores here in the states, and the business surprised them. Um, at the same time, we are running a very few you know projects that we're conducting right now. And what we're seeing is that the longer this stretches, the more business begins to come back. We've seen in the you know, in the papers and in, in the press that people are beginning to even break social protocols a little bit. They're traveling a little bit more. They're feeling a little bit cooped up. Um, you know, I'm optimistic that it'll, you know, it's certainly not going to be flat. There'll, there'll definitely be um, a decline, but we're penciling somewhere between 20 and 25 percent down here into Q4. And I think Q4 is, is the wild card right now. How are people going to react? What's the outlook like? look like? And, you know, again, it really gets to holiday shopping. People are going to want to get out there. Yeah, I mean, we're hearing as much as this helps that many retailers are buying, you know, kind of, you know, 50% of what they bought in 2019 with the idea that they can chase it. Um, and, and that to me is, an, I mean, hey, there's no reason everybody shouldn't approach the holiday season like that every year because, you know, it would lead to a, a much cleaner kind of break post holiday. But we are hearing, I'd say, a lot more planning go into it and a lot more thought um, around, um, you know, holiday. All right. So, so last question. And there are like about 30 left, but I, I will email those to you guys afterwards. Um, what do we think in terms of holiday? You know, just, you know, if, if we kind of are on this time frame that we think, you know, we're, we're back up and running in July, do we think that the consumer is optimistic, positive, upbeat, or, you know, what do we think and, and what categories and what types of retail? Um, I'm trying to put like nine questions together. Um, so we got asked about like fast fashion. You already talked about department stores. Um, but what kinds of retailers do we think will do well? And do we have an estimate just for the holiday season, which we call, let's call it November, December? Who wants to go first? Well, I'm <laughs> going to ask a, I'm gonna ask a question, Rick. which is, what do you think is going to happen to the experience? There was a drive before this in the last several years for experience. People were spending more money on holidays for different experiences, et cetera. Okay? If they spend less money on experiences because they don't want to be they don't want to travel as much. They don't want to be in large environments. They don't want to be in movie theaters, ball games, et cetera. What's that do to their disposable income? How do they reallocate that? Well, so, it's interesting. I'm going to ask, answer a question with a question. It's right, the same question in terms of food at home versus food away from home, right? And food at home is significantly less expensive than food away from home. So there, there are a lot of shifts that are happening that are giving people more money, right? Even, even with the unemployment situation, which is definitely not a positive, but they are finding kind of the, these pockets um, with which they can spend and whether it's less spent on experiences, less, and you know, food away from home is an experience. So it, like I said, I'll, I'll answer your question with a question and then Rick, Rick and Mark are on the hook. Yeah, and, and I, I talked about it earlier. You know, certainly the categories where we see opportunities is anything associated with home and home entertainment. Um, you know, clearly with, as Jeff mentioned and Mark talked about it, the decline in just restaurants because of the social distance protocols. 
coupled with um, people's reticence to go outside in large crowds, they're going to actually focus on in-home entertainment. So, you know, I would expect to, and we've seen this in the past. Now, granted, COVID's a little bit different, and I think it even adds more weight to it, that, you know, when there's economic disruptions, people will tighten their belts, spend more time at home with smaller gatherings, you know, entertain friends and family. And when they do that, they want their homes to look nice. They, if they're cooking more, they're gonna to wanna to have the right utensils, the right cookware, et cetera. Um, so I would expect to see, you know, domestics, home decor, small electrics, cookware, all of that type of stuff, see at least, you know, a decent bump, whether that be in brick and mortar or online. Um, but at the same time, brick and mortar is going to suffer. Um, Again, I, I mentioned the 20 to 25 percent. That's kind of across the board, but I, I think some categories will be lower than that. I think fast fashion, which in a lot of cases relies on mall traffic, because they're located quite often in mall environments, is going to suffer because there has been disruption in that supply chain. It's not easily rectified. Um, but again, the categories that I look at are, you know, as I said, the home, anything related to the home and entertaining at home, and I would expect to see, um, you know. Carol, we talked about it ad nauseum. That's what's going to suffer the most. Right. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, like I said, there's still a long list of questions. I have many questions. Hopefully we can do this again. This was great. Thank you so much for your time and your insights. Uh, everyone really appreciates and thanks for joining Corsite Conversations. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Great day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Stay safe, everybody.